Okay, greetings to one and to all. I want to welcome you to this section in the series of studies that we've had thus far. Now, I just want to say firstly, thank you for all the comments and the questions received as they not only challenge your thinking, but it also challenges me in order to give a correct answer. Now, I have received a fair amount of questions which will be answered today. Now, we've received seven questions in total and they're all going to be answered today. So, right now, we're going to go through our question and answers session. Now, during the question and answer session, I just want to set a reminder that this is not a debate. It is, as stated, a question and answer session. So if you want to talk further on any points or any questions that you may have left, or you, if you want to explain, want me to elaborate on these questions that you've asked, you can email me on this YouTube page and um, we can take it from there. But I do pray that the answers here um, will be sufficient enough to leave a foundation um, that you may be able to study further on as it's been set. Okay, so as we begin, please bow with me at our question and answers session. Dear Father in Heaven, I thank you for the questions that we've received and I thank you that your word um, is so clear and so plain to us. As we see now, as we go through the questions, May all the answers be from the Bible, may it be clear, may it be understood, and may we go back and study these things for ourselves, that we can have a set foundation. We thank you for the answers that you're going to give us now, and may these answers give us hope of eternal life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, so let's start with question number one. It says, Thanks for your study on the death of man. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8 that when you're absent in the body, you are present with the Lord. So he is saying when you are not in the body, you go to heaven because God is there. Isn't this proof that when you die, you go to heaven? Okay, that's an excellent question. Thanks for asking that. Now, let's take a look at the verse and see if we can answer this. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says it as this. It says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, from the outset, it looks like Paul is saying that you have a living spirit which can come out of your body. So when you die, your living spirit goes to heaven, as the verse says, present with the Lord. But in Genesis, it says that God breathed into man and man became a living soul. Now, Paul was, you could say, a scholar of the law, which is somebody who's very learned in um, the teachings of the law. So he knows the law from back to front. So when it said in Genesis that when God breathed into man and man became a living soul, he knew that. So even though when he said to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord, what was Paul saying? So, is Paul saying that when you die, you go to heaven? Well, let's see. Okay, so in order to understand 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, we must look at the context and also the whole picture. So, let's look at the preceding verses and we can then see if we can answer this question. Okay, so 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 1, says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall be found naked, for... We that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be clothed, rather we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the same, rather for the self same thing, is God, who hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, so from verse 1 to verse 5, we see Paul making some points. Verse 6 concludes by saying, therefore. 
The word therefore means to sum up what is said previously. For example, um, let's just say that I mentioned something in a paragraph and at the end of the paragraph I say, therefore I live in London. So, let's take out the points which Paul concluded with in verse 8 and we can see what that word therefore means. Okay, so let's read from verse 1 to verse 3 again. And that says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so that being clothed, we shall be found naked. Okay. So, as we look at these verses, we see mentioned the future hope of being clothed with the earthly tabernacle, this earthly house, whilst at the moment we are groaning with this earthly tabernacle, with this earthly body. Now, listen to what verse 4 says. It says, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Okay, now Paul here is saying that we've grown in this tabernacle, which is the earthly tabernacle, our current earthly bodies, and look forward to being clothed in immortality, because it says that mortality will be swallowed up with life, as it said in verse 4. Okay, so let's look at verse 5 to verse 7. Now he that have wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of his spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Okay, so, this is saying that God has put his spirit in us. And that spirit gives us the hope that we will no longer be in this earthly home, which is our bodies, this earthly tabernacle. So when Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, he is speaking this in faith. As it said, we live by faith and not by sight. He is not saying that when you die you go to heaven. Now to make it more clear, let us remember that this is the book of what? 2 Corinthians, which means that Paul must have said something in 1 Corinthians. So let's ask a question. Did Paul ever mention anything about being clothed with immortality? Has he covered this subject already on receiving our heavenly bodies as it's mentioned in verse 4 um, which says that mortality might be swallowed up with life? Notice this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 reading from verse 51 says this Behold I show you a mystery We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory now you remember in um, the verses that we just read where it said life will be swallowed up with mortality Paul is saying at this time then that will happen so when does being absent from the body and present with the Lord take place from what we've read at the coming of Christ at the last trump so as we went through the subject on death we saw that when one dies, they have no thoughts, no emotions, no memory, everything is passed away. And you can read Job chapter 14 verse 10 to 14 to get more. That's Job chapter 14 verse 10 to 14. Okay, so naturally, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord is actually understandable now. Why? Because when you die, the Bible calls it a sleep. How quickly is, you could say for example, how quickly um, is 8 hours compared to someone who's awake, to someone who's sleeping? Well, to, for that person who's awake, it takes forever. 
if you're just standing in one place for eight hours, it would take a very long time. But for somebody who's sleeping for eight hours, it's instantaneous. You blink and it's already, you've already woken up and eight hours have passed. So initially when you die, the next conscious thought will be seeing Christ come in the clouds. So, just to conclude on that, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord means the next thought you receive is seeing Christ come in the clouds of heaven and then you will be taken to heaven. So in result, the question you could say is correct because when you, do, when you are absent from the body, you are present with the Lord. But the answer is based upon the timing. And that time when that happens is when Christ comes again with the last trump. So I hope that's answered your question. And thanks very much for asking that question because it was a, a very good question. Okay, so question number two. Will people live in the city after the 1,000 years or during? I know during the 1,000 years, the saints will be in heaven. Is Christ preparing the city or a physical mansion? Okay, this is a very interesting question. I hope um, the answer that I give is um, sufficient enough. Um, if you look at Revelation chapter 21, we notice that the city is coming to earth prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, this language is in context of a wedding. When the bride is walking down the aisle to get married, she's coming down prepared. Now, prior to that, she is getting ready. Now, with that illustration, I believe heaven is prepared already. Um, if you look in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says the gospel will go out through all the world and then the end will come. So I believe that during the 1,000 years and after the 1,000 years, we will be in the city because the city of God is in heaven. Now, it can be even deeper when we think about it. Um, if you look at the word Jerusalem, the word Jerusalem means peace. So we also realize that in Revelation 21, the city is called the New Jerusalem. So when we have pain, suffering, um, tears wiped away and so on, we can say then we, that we are at true peace. So it could be that when the city comes down prepared, it could be that during the 1000 years, we are being prepared for peace because we, at that time we'll be having tears in our eyes because those people who we expected to be in heaven and are not there, it will be sad for us. But we can be looking forward to the time that our tears will be wiped away, no more pain, no suffering, no sin, all of that is completely gone. So during the 1000 years and after the 1000 years, I believe that we will be in the city, but it will only come down as a type to say that it is completely prepared in the sense that we don't have to have that pain in our hearts anymore because um, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 that um, there'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sickness, etc. So I believe that as we will be in heaven, we will be in the city. And when we come back from heaven to earth, we will be in the city. Now in regards to the mansions, I believe it to be physical because um, John chapter 14 says that in my father's house are many mansions. So for it to say there are many mansions, it means that the mansions are already there. Now I haven't seen in the Bible where uh, mansions refer to anything symbolic. Um, but if you do, please let me know. And I hope this has um, answered your question because that was a very good question. So thank you for asking. Okay, question number three. In reference to judgment, is there a such thing or is there a difference between salvation and non-salvation issues? Example, although I don't, people eating clean meats after the health message compared to people not accepting the Sabbath as a day of rest. That's another good question. James chapter 4 verse 17 says, Therefore, to him that know to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So to answer that, if something comes to your knowledge and you see it clearly in God's words, if you choose to go against it, it is sin. All right, now the example here is, as you mentioned, the Sabbath and health. Um, the Sabbath is clearly in the Ten Commandments and Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 says that this is the whole duty of man. So this comes up in view as something that is salvational. Now with meat, 
That is going to be covered in another subject coming up very soon. But just on the outset, you can research this by the way animals are treated. Um, the way they are actually treated is, is completely different 10 to 30 years ago or even longer. So it is something to look into to see if it is good to eat. But from what I've seen, it's not good to eat. Um, the way animals are treated today... I don't believe it's safe to eat meat anymore, but this is something that you may need to study or research for yourself in order to find if that's an issue. But on a larger scope, there are issues that are plainly not salvational issues. The question is, if an issue comes up which affects our lives in the judgment, we need to heed to it. So if I say that it was more than 5,000 people that Jesus fed with those five loaves and two fishes, because we need to consider the women and the children and someone else may say nope it's 5,000 to the exact number that's not a salvational issue now if there are points in the Bible you are not sure of as a salvational issue the best thing to do is just to follow the example of Jesus that's all you can really do because Jesus' life is the standard and if you want to know how Jesus lived you look into Second Peter chapter 2 reading from verse 18 to the end of the chapter so I believe that will help you out there in regards to issues of salvational and non-salvational anything that affects our lives in the judgment is considered a salvational issue anything that isn't is not a salvational issue and that comes down to studying the Bible to see how what you may be doing here or there comes to an effect in your salvation in regards to the judgment Okay, so I hope this has answered your question. Once again, thank you for asking, as that, that too was a good question. Now, question number four. I'm curious to know, where in the Bible does it say that if a man did not get an opportunity to know God, they will not be damned? Hope to hear from you soon. Peace be with you. Um, thank you very much for that um, question and for those words of encouragement. Um, Acts chapter 17, verse 22, says this. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life, and breath, and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed, and the bonds of their habitations, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, and more, and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then, as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Now listen to what it says in verse 13. It says, And the times of ignorance, rather the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Okay, so, based upon what we just read, it shows that if you're in a state of ignorance, you can't be held accountable for that. Now, these men were living up to the light, the knowledge, the understanding that they had until they came across the truth which Paul revealed unto them. Okay, but notice it says, in times of ignorance, God winked at, but commands to repent. Now, if you repent, it means that you have sinned. Now, it is only when you know that you have sinned that you need to repent. So when Paul revealed the truth about who God really was, they were now held accountable to it. But until 
the time that they didn't know, or until the time that they knew rather, they were not held accountable for anything. So I hope that's answered your question. Thanks for that question. That's a very good question. Okay, question number five. In the thousand years, who will live on earth? If all the righteous people are in heaven and all unrighteous are in the grave, who populates earth? Okay, thanks for this question. Um, I believe this, this, this question was answered in the 1000 year study. Right During the 1000 years, Jeremiah says that it will be without form and void, which is the same language as before the world was created. Now we are told that during the 1000 years, in this condition of the earth, Satan will be bound. So those who populate the earth will be Satan and his fallen angels who will await their final punishment at the end of the 1000 years. After everything is destroyed, along with all the sins of this world, that's when the, the righteous will inhabit the earth. And you can read that in Revelation chapter 21. But for more information, please listen to the subject on um, the millennium because that answers the question in detail. So I hope that's answered your question for now. And once again, thank you for that question. Okay, two more questions. Question number six. It says, God has always given prophecy a number. Noah, Daniel, destruction of Jerusalem, etc. What is the time that the present day will end? I've heard many dates, 2015. Does God give us a date? I understand there are signs to watch for, but is there a date? Excellent, excellent question. Okay, um, Mark chapter 13 verse 33 says, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Now if you look at verse 32, it says that God alone knows the time. I do believe there is a time, but that time is not revealed to us. We only know of the signs, and these signs are to give direct indication that the end is near. Now Matthew chapter 24 verse 6 says this, And ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars, see that ye are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Okay, I just want to point out something quite interesting here. The word sorrows in verse um, in verse 8 of Matthew 24, the word sorrows in the Greek means birth pangs. Now when it comes to birth pangs, we are talking of birth pains. Okay, now what happens when contractions come closer and closer in the um, time of pregnancy? It means the baby is coming very soon, right? Now, if the Bible uses language like that, and we see signs like earthquakes, famines, pestilence, plagues, wars, troubles, as we see them increase, which we have, that is an indication that the end is near. I know a lot of people say out there that earthquakes, plagues, famines, they've been going on, we've always had those. But what they fail to realize is that the Bible says that this is the beginning of sorrows or birth pains. So the signs in the Bible, which talks about these earthquakes, um, these pestilence and plagues, have increased dramatically, which indicates to us that the end is very near. Not the fact that they have always been earthquakes, because I know also that there have always been earthquakes and plagues and such. But the Bible has said that when you see these things increase, that's when you should know that the time is coming to an end. So we have a date, but the date is only known to God. But the point we need to hang on to for ourselves is Matthew chapter 13 verse, rather Mark chapter 13 verse 33, which is to watch and to pray. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks again for that question. Okay, we come to our last question, question number seven. It says, fair enough, you got people who know this, but what about people who have died and never knew anything on this topic? That's not fair on them if they are lost. So what happens to them? Please answer this. Okay, 
All right, this answer was really um, answered in question number four. But you can also read Romans chapter 2, um, reading from verse 11 to 14. Um, this will explain that those who have never heard the truth or had the opportunity of hearing the truth will not be condemned for it. Um, in fact, if you read in John chapter 5 verse 28, it states that there will be people who have done good unto the resurrection of life. So basically those people who know to do good and have done good in their lives, not knowing anything of God in particular, but yet living up to what they knew, they are living as if they had the truth already. Their mindset is showing that they had the truth even if they didn't have it. So everything that they've done, everything that they've lived up to, whether it be good or bad, they will receive their reward. So, just to conclude on that, if no one knew the topic of Christ and salvation, yet lived up to what they knew faithfully, they will not be condemned. So, um, again, if you want to know that answer, you can just listen to question four, which I just gave the answer to. So I hope... That again has answered your question. That's a very, very good question. It's a very key question because a lot of people want to know the answer to that one in particular. Okay, so my friends, this concludes the question and answer session. I do hope that all the questions were answered clearly and carefully, that you can leave here with an understanding and that everything was founded upon the Bible. Again, if you wanted to know more information, you can just email me and we will we'll continue um, from there if you have any more points to put on the questions that you've asked in this session. But always remember to please go back and study these things for yourself that you may have a foundation and a clear understanding on your personal Bible study. As it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Okay, our next subject is going to be the investigative judgment. You understand this if you have listened to the subject on the 2300 days and also the sanctuary. So if you haven't listened to those subjects, please go back and listen to that before you listen to the next subject. But for now, the question and answer session is finished. And if you have any more questions, please leave them in the comments box and they'll be answered in the next question and answer session. So I thank you for listening and I pray now that you all have a clear understanding and now we're going to pray just to close. So be, please bow with me as we pray to close. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for these answers that you've um, inspired us with. I pray that all the questions were answered correctly from the Bible and I pray Lord that as we go into our next subject, the investigative judgment, which is to cleanse the sinner and make him innocent, please get our minds prepared for that and may we all be blessed and we thank you once again and thank you for who you are in Jesus name we pray Amen